tens of thousands of people participated in carrying out the atrocities of Hitler and his Third Reich. The Nuremberg trials, held in 1945 and 1946 in The Hague in the Netherlands, tried 23 of the worst criminals under Hitler's regime. This did not include Hitler himself, who had committed suicide in 1945. About half of those who were convicted of Nazi war crimes were sentenced to hang. The subsequent Nuremberg trials held from 1946 to 1949, tried another 185 defendants, with 142 of them being found guilty of at least one charge. But files listed more than 90,000 other Nazi war criminals. Where were they? Did they escape? Simon Wiesenthal was a Ukrainian Jew who had survived the death camps and set out on his life's mission to try to track down every single Nazi who had perpetrated the atrocities Hitler had prescribed. But how long should those people be held accountable for those crimes that they may have committed when they were in their early 20s? Do they need to be tried in the 1940s? 50s? What about the 70s? Or today? Is there a statute of limitations on when a Nazi war criminal can be tried for his or her actions? This short clip gives you some insight into the search for people who had committed atrocities during World War II in the name of Germany. We were loaded into cattle cars. You could hear screaming and hollering from the whistle to the smoke, 30 minutes. Decades later, memories of the Holocaust are still alive. So are Nazi war criminals. He was a sadistic murderer. The moment he was seen, you knew that someone was going to die. SS officers, names etched in the victims' minds like tattoos. Many flee to South America, starting new lives with new identities. He thought he was untouchable. This is not a photostat of your membership in the Nazi party. No, never. They denied, of course, everything. Others remain in Europe, but none are forgotten. He's an evil, murdering Nazi bastard. There's no doubt about it. Plans are hatched. Hunt down these men and charge them with crimes against humanity. It's not uh, difficult to kill. But we don't want to kill, we want a trial. He was an enormous fish for the journalists to bring back. Government spies, TV journalists, and passionate individuals risk everything in pursuit of justice. They wanted to make Nazis all over the world fear of their life. It was a complete surprise, a shock for us. You have to pay one day for the crime you committed. February 21st, 1971, Cologne, West Germany. Political activists Serge and Beate Klarsfeld stake out an apartment building in a quiet neighborhood. It's home to Nazi war criminal Kurt Lischke. It is 100% Lischke's job to organize the arrests, deportation, and the ferrying of the Jews east, which of course is that great Nazi euphemism for exterminating people in camps such as Auschwitz. A legal loophole protects Nazis like Lischke from prosecution in Germany. So the Klarsfelds are on a mission to change the law and make Lischke pay for his crimes. We had learned that most of the Nazi criminals who had been active in the deportation of the Jews of France had remained in Germany under their own names. There certainly were quite a few Nazis in the government. There was no extradition policy, at least it wasn't a sort of formal one. We were very outraged by the fact that they became uh, uh, judges, uh, businessmen, high officials. 
They wanted to force the Germans to see that they had in their midst a major Nazi criminal. There was no will to bring uh, the Nazi criminals to justice. Karsfeld's believe in action. The husband and wife team travel from their home in Paris to track down the war criminal. Beata called uh, information in Cologne and had no problem immediately getting an address for Kurt Lischke. Kurt Lischke, uh, this and this number and uh, his address, Bergisch Gladbacher Straße. You know, it was as easy as this. For Serge, this isn't just about politics. A French Jew, he lost family in the Holocaust. We saw him leaving to go to work as an accountant. He was a businessman. But 30 years earlier, Lischke has a very different job. As Gestapo chief in Paris, he orchestrates the deportation of 73,000 Jews. Kurt Lischke is your typical career Gestapo officer. He's in Berlin before the war, and he's progressing up the Nazi hierarchy. He's sent out to Paris, where he heads up the, the Jewish Affairs Department. And that doesn't mean looking after Jews. That means effectively killing them. He organized the arrest of Jews in France uh, and their deportation to Auschwitz. It was a death factory, basically. You know, it was a death factory. Kurt Lischke was in charge of annihilating a people. After the war, he fell in the hands of uh, the Czech authorities. They released him in 1950. He went back to live in Germany and he lived quietly with his family and tried to get on with a normal life. He was a prosperous German businessman. It's extraordinary to think that someone could have gone from exterminating people to living this sort of upper middle class life, but that was the way it was. Lischke prospers. He is now a finance executive for a grain shipping company in Cologne. He was sending uh, grains uh, exactly like Jews. He was uh, sending grains. Uh, it's the same work as sending Jews. The next morning, the Klarsfelds are back on Lischke Street. This time, they've hired a cameraman to try to capture the Nazi on film. Put yourself in this situation. It's called the past. Your name is John, and you are an accountant for a large corporation. The year is 1975, and your company is scheduled to expand its operations to Brazil. You are sent down to assist in opening the office. The company has sent some of its best employees to work on this. One of the people you meet when you arrive in Sao Paulo is Fred Niebert, a building engineer from New York. You think he's a nice guy, and although he seems to be glad to be working on the project, he always looks a bit nervous to you. You let it go. Besides, he is a very intelligent man and knows a lot about many different subjects. You're learning a lot from him. As the weeks go by, however, you begin to feel uneasy about Fred. You can't quite pinpoint it, but while he's always willing to talk about work-related situations, he does not like to talk about his family, or childhood, or home, or anything related to his personal life. You know other people who keep to themselves, but this is starting to make you feel a little creepy. One day, then, when Fred is talking about the ventilation system in the building, he refers to a job he had during World War II in his home country. You try to ask a few questions, but he shuts down. All of a sudden, the pieces start to fit together. Expertise in building engineering, quiet, too quiet about his past, a wartime job in Europe, maybe Germany. You wonder if Fred is Friedrich Bertrand, a guard in Hitler's SS who the Nazi hunter Simon Wiesenthal has been trying to track down. You've read about the hunt for Bertrand, who Wiesenthal thought might be in Latin America. All evidence seems to point that way, but you're not sure what to do. 